Let's talk about some treasure cards in the Tombs of Terror. Hey, buddy, watch this. That's right, we already talked about some of the passives that are available in the Tombs of Terror, but now I want to talk about the treasure cards themselves. These are cards that you'll add into your deck, sometimes minions, sometimes spells, weapons even, and you'll be using them throughout the course of your Tombs of Terror run. And once again, I've ranked them from the ones I think are going to be the weakest to the ones I think will be the very best. Starting off with the weakest options here, I only have a few. Most of these just have some kind of limitation I think will make them far too inconsistent or risky to run. Rock and Issue, for instance, you have to have lackeys to make this card work. If you don't have lackeys, it's not very good. So it can be hard to narrow your deck that closely. Like, yes, if you manage to get a ton of lackey summoners, sure, Rock and Issue could work, but the difficulty in achieving that is going to make it so unreliable that it will probably ruin more runs than it actually helps. Cards like Bob's Bouncer is kind of cool because it's like a cheaper brawl in a lot of ways with this ridiculous upside, but often that upside is very, very difficult to achieve. It's just going to be a lot of luck, very random, and a slightly better brawl isn't good enough on its own. So the occasions where there's a ton of upside with this one uh, just aren't worth it in my mind because otherwise it's just not as good as other treasure options, right? A lot of opportunity cost to overcome there. Stone Fox statue is pretty cool. You know, it's a couple free minions, but I think often this will get stuck in your hand. We're like waiting for a really cool thing to copy. And often it's just going to be like random one ones and two twos and three threes on board that aren't all that exciting. So uh, again, all these are great cards in the scheme of Hearthstone, but compared to other treasures, I think this one lacks some of the power level. And then finally, the Aegis of Death here. Pretty cool weapon idea. Your hero's immune. Uh, this loses durability every turn. And then after 10 times of losing durability, it's going to break and you will die, which sometimes fights in dungeon run modes take longer than 10 turns. Some bosses will just grind you down, making this card super risky. Uh, beyond that, uh, if there is any weapon removal that's like randomly added to one of the enemy boss's hands, well, you're just dead right away because the death rattle will kill you instantly. So a ton of risk to overcome with this card, although neat in theory and design, just far too unreliable. Moving on to some situational cards. These are cards that are sometimes good, sometimes not so strong, just depending on when you draft them what class hero you're playing, etc. For instance, with a card like Feoris' Blade, this has a lot of upside. If you can start killing multiple minions with Feoris' Blade, it's going to keep getting buffed and buffed and stronger and stronger, and that's really cool. But if you don't have enough life to tank all those hits, well, you're going to die, so it's just not going to work out. And then with a card like Murky's Battlehorn, this is a great way to summon uh, two big boards immediately, occasionally trade, but Murlocs aren't the strongest thing. So if you have other big cards you're looking to play or you don't have ways to leverage a wide board murky's battlehorn might not go as far as other options then things like mystical mirage for instance like this is a really cool idea getting a total refresh on your mana but you're losing the cards in hand you're getting them replaced with presumably random cards which are going to be way worse that said if your deck isn't all that strong sure mystical mirage could be great you have awesome things treasure cards big legendary threats, Mystical Mirage might be riskier than it's worth. So now let's talk about some strong cards, and I think these are generally good. They do something big, reliable, cool, swingy, and again, I'm not going to talk about all these just because there are so many freaking treasures in the Tombs of Terror, which by the way is awesome, but I do want to spotlight a few in particular. For instance, Amakir the Light is a pretty cool minion that will give you two random healing spells when it attacks and those spells cost zero and keep in mind things like siphon soul are considered healing spells so there are some great removal options it's not just like face healing there's some pretty sneaky cool spells in the amic here the light pool which means uh this minion has a ton of upside if you can get it to attack a few turns if you give it something like stealth with some other passive treasures out there amic here could be ridiculous or if you do things like the plague of madness and force this minion to attack an additional time on the second wing scorching dunes amic here is absurd and then you've got a card like gnome obliterator which is a two mana pyroblast that deals 10 damage which can be removal in a pinch or just some face damage to a boss 
finishing them off very uh, affordably, but then that's also going to stack over the course of your runs. If you get this one early, you might just deal something like 60, 70 damage to the Plague Lord when you end up fighting it, which can give you a ginormous head start. If you can duplicate this card, add extra copies, shuffle some in somehow, it's going to go even crazier against the Plague Lord. So a lot of real upside in this card if you're looking to one-shot a run in particular. And then you've got a card like Map of Uldum, which is only zero mana, but allows you to discover a card and gain a mana crystal for each boss you've defeated this run. So this is like this enormous innervate that's going to give you a complete and total hand refill when you get to something like the Plague Lord, which means you can pick a lot of strong cards and play probably your best one immediately. So this one scales really well into the later parts of runs, which is great because you don't need a lot of treasures in the first few bosses. Those are easy to beat. But when things get hairy on those, you know, last couple bosses, the Plague Lord map of Uldum adds a lot of strength to your deck. So now let's move into my top five treasures starting off with crusty the crustacean <laughs> this is a one mana three four minion already a crazy stat line but also it's battle cry destroys a minion and then crusty gains double that minion's attack and health so this is like the most absurd single minion removal swing card ever like the ultimate crab the ultimate tech card i do wish his art kind of lived up to that expectation a little more but i know that in dungeon run mode style stuff bosses can do like crazy op things they can like first off they have extra mana usually in the later part of runs so they can play like mountain giants super early in the game right and sometimes you just get overrun by that stuff you can't quite keep up but crusty enables you to take whatever their crazy op play is and turn it back on them and gain an advantage. So for instance, if they did play an early Mountain Giant and you had the Krusty the Crustacean in hand to answer it, well, guess what that means? That means you're going to be adding 16-16 to Krusty's stat line, right? Because he's not only killing the Mountain Giant, which is worth it alone for one mana, but it's gaining double the attack and health. So that's 8 times 2, 16-16 making this minion that's right a 1920 for one mana that destroys a minion that is completely ridiculous and game winning in and of itself in many cases so yeah crusty has a lot of immediate upside and i think will be a fantastic card anytime you can grab him moving on here to tracking device the number four spot this is a pretty nifty card it uh, is a start of game effect. You'll draw it immediately. So you always have a turn one play, which can be pretty nice. And then we'll also draw you a two, three, four, and five cost card from your deck. So you're guaranteed to open the game well. And I like this a lot because consistency can be the downfall of many a dungeon run. Sometimes if you just whiff on a turn or two because you don't have a play, that gives the enemy boss way too much of an advantage and you can't quite get there. This prevents any such situation. Now, it's also noteworthy that if you have really powerful stuff at any of these mana costs, you might just be able to draw really consistently into your like awesome three mana signature treasure, right? If that's a part of your deck. So it increases your ability to find some really powerful stuff as well. And I think that having something like this, just making your deck that much more consistent goes a long way. It also just helps you kind of learn what you can do in the early game and help you kind of line up certain kinds of plays. That's a very powerful asset in things like the Tombs of Terror. So now let's move on to another absurd card. This is the Advanced Targeting Monocle, Sir Finley's Monocle here. And uh, it's a five mana spell that casts a copy of all spells in your deck with targets chosen randomly. So this is the kind of thing that could backfire if your deck was built poorly. If you had like three Pyroblasts, yes, you could Pyroblast yourself in the face three times in a row and die. That sort of thing could happen. But alternatively, if you build your deck in a smart way, particularly supporting a card like this one, it can be absolutely bonkers. Some spells are just universally good, right? Flame Strikes only affect enemy minions. Secrets are things that are going to get played and work. Uh, some things say things like friendly minions, so some buffs might always buff your things as opposed to your opponents. And some damage only deals damage to the enemy hero, like Sinister Strikes. So there are certain kinds of cards that support this really well and makes this just a bonkers swing turn 
crazy board clears. You can summon all kinds of minions for yourself. There are so many different ways this can work out very, very well. If you're the only person with minions on board, buffs become absolutely crazy. So there's a handful of different kinds of decks that can really support this one. And when you play it, it's often just going to win you games because it does so freaking much for only five mana. That makes this a very powerful card. Moving on to my number two spot, we got a really cool one here. It's Hearthstone. It's the game itself, but it's a zero mana card. And let me explain how this works. At the start of the game, you're gonna draw your Hearthstone. And anytime you use your Hearthstone, you will escape to the tavern and you'll remove the Hearthstone from your adventure deck. Now, what that means is if you're down and out and you're about to lose, you don't have a chance to win. You're on the Plague Lord. You've got them down like 150 health, but they're about to kill you. They got lethal on board next turn. You can utilize your Hearthstone. You'll get a get out of jail free card, essentially. You'll go back to Bizarre Bob's Tavern. You'll have a chance to tweak and, in fact, even strengthen your deck in many cases. Then you'll come back in for the fight again, which means... This is like the ultimate pass card. You can screw up a ton and still come back into the game with another chance. Things can go poorly. If your RNG rolls are bad, just drop your Hearthstone, come back in. Now, you only get to do it once per run. Once you use it, you use it, but that's okay, right? It can save you a lot of time and can save a run from disaster. So I think this is incredibly powerful. Uh, you might make the argument that this is only good if you're losing, but that's fine. If you're winning anyway, who cares? Like you're doing what you need to do and you don't need any kind of treasure. So the Hearthstone gives you a chance to make your deck a little better still because the Bizarre Bob encounter is very helpful for improving your deck. So uh, it's not only good in bad situations. It also does just help occasionally as well. So uh, all in all, very fun idea for Hearthstone. It captures the essence of what a Hearthstone was in World of Warcraft really nicely and also serves as a very powerful tool in any Tombs of Terror deck. And then finally, the number one choice here is the Sack of Lamps. Start of game, draw this and fill your hand with Zephyrus's Lamps. And Zephyrus's Lamps are zero mana cards uh, that give you the perfect card like you might have seen in a recent Tavern Brawl. So basically you get zero mana Zephyrus activations and you get an entirely full hand of them, which anybody who's played Zephyrus a little bit doesn't need to be explained to just how powerful that can be. That is a ridiculous effect. You're gonna have all kinds of great things, whether it's just the perfect awesome minion to play, board clears when you need them, burst damage when you need it, follow up bloodlust and savage roars. It's all there because Zephyrus gives it to you and you get a lot of lamps because at the start of the game, uh, you could use it immediately for six. You can also just wait until you run out of plays and your hand is almost empty and use this at that point and get like eight or nine lamps late in the game. Theoretically, even 10 if you top decked this. So yeah, this is just very, very, very good. Uh, <laughs> nightmare for enemy bosses. Thank God there's nobody behind the scenes playing those because this would drive them absolutely crazy. But uh, turns out the perfect card, turn after turn after turn, is a pretty perfect situation. And there you go. Those are the treasure cards ranked in my humble and personal opinion. Now, of course, some people out there are going to disagree about what's good, what's bad. That's cool. I want to hear your thoughts. Share your take in the comments below what I missed, what I got right. Uh, we're going to crowdsource this so that the people watching will have a really good idea of what things they should pick in the run. That said, also, don't forget to just have some fun. Pick the cards that look the most enjoyable sometimes. That's as or more important than just picking what's best. So I hope to hear some great thoughts from you guys down there. But until then, thank you so very much for watching. And until next time, game on.